Welcome to 21st Century Radio. I'm Dr. Zoe Hieronymus, and joining us this portion of our program is Dr. Mark Beckhoff. Mark is world-renowned as a biologist who specializes in cognitive ethology, the study of animal minds, and behavioral ecology. He is currently the Professor Emeritus of Ecology and Evolutionary Biology at the University of Colorado Boulder and is a scholar-in-residence at the University of Denver's Institute for Human-Animal Connection. I recently had a chance Mark, to read two of your books, an older one of your 20, Animals Matter, and your more recent 2010 release, A New World Library, The Animal Manifesto. Thank you so much for joining us. Oh, well, thanks for having me. I'm well, it's really a it's your, it's a pleasure to to hear the voice of the man that so many of us in the sort of animal awareness, I guess, for just lack of better word at the moment, to talk about this whole issue of the consciousness of the animal kingdom and the interface with the human kingdom. Share with us your own origins of getting involved with this field professionally. Well, I think it started when I was a kid, um, when I was about three years old, I was always asking my parents what animals were thinking and what they were feeling, and always got very upset when I saw people mistreating, you know, especially their companion dogs. And I wrote a book in 2002 called Minding Animals, and and that really just came from a discussion I had with my folks. They said that I always minded animals, you know, I always cared about them, minded them, took care of them, and that I was minding them by attributing, you know, feelings and thoughts to them. So I think the origins go a long way back. (laughs) And so when you look back at your own life, I thought what was intriguing, because I read a little bit about it, that um, you didn't have, like, um, a lot of animals around you, and yet you had this inherent love of and appreciation for the sentience, I guess, of, of those you did engage. Yeah, I mean... My mom had been bitten by a dog um, when she was young, and she didn't dislike animals, but she actually was, you know, slightly afraid of them. So I had my requisite goldfish, like all the kids at the time had, but I always attributed to growing up in a home of, uh, where there was a lot of empathy and compassion that, you know, generalized to humans as well. So, you know, in my writings, you know, I always talk about what I call this umbrella of compassion, the compassion footprint, if you will. And so I just think it came from just being in a compassion at home. So coming back then to when you began this work, you know, there there have always been humans, and certainly the indigenous peoples of the planet have always shown respect for the animal kingdom, but the Western industrial technological society has viewed animals quite differently. Yeah, I mean, a lot of my insights, if you will, into animals seem to be, you know, reflecting uh, the the insights of indigenous people, people who spend a lot of time outdoors. And, And you're right. I mean, I think as time has gone on, people have become, you know, extremely over busy and removed from nature. I, you know, for this book I'm writing now, I'm looking at some studies that show that, you know, I don't remember what it was, but the numbers were staggering in terms of the small percentage of kids who actually play outdoors and the percentage of time that they spend outdoors. You know, they're locked to their computers. They have to go to school, you know, where most so many schools are getting rid of free play periods and, you know, just recreation because they think that it's going to be better for the kids to spend more time in classrooms in front of computers. So... Um, I think the the big link, if you will, would be to getting outdoors, which is, of course, the way a lot of Native people live. And and as you began to do your work and became very articulate and able to help so many other people in the world who were pursuing this path of animal consciousness, that there really is this interspecies communication and an effort at all times for life to talk to us, but do we hear it? Absolutely. You said it better than I could. I mean, you know, you go outside and you hear birds sing or, you know, you just watch animals, uh, you know, butterflies alight on a branch or, I mean, I'm, I'm lucky. I live in the mountains of Colorado and I've got cougars and black bears and red foxes and coyotes at my home. 
But, you know, even, you know, in the middle of cities, when I go to New York City, you go to Central Park, you see the squirrels doing fascinating things. So, you know, I'm convinced that the more time you spend outdoors and the more time you appreciate, you know, who these animals are, um, how they interact with one another, how they interact with other species, and, of course, how they interact with humans can really be educational and as we learn, you know, the more we learn, the more we appreciate and understand, and the more we respect these animals. I mean, I think it's fairly straightforward. You and I would agree on that. And yet, <laughs> and yet we also can recognize that speciesism is a reality, where humans say we're number one, we're more important, we're, you know, we are the status quo, and anything that gets in our way, well, we can just do away with it. Right. I mean, you know, a lot of, you know, some people appeal to, you know, religion, and they talk about dominion rather than um, stewardship and us being stewards of the planet, not dominating. Um, but, but right, when, you know, once again, you know, even, I, I always tell people, you know, even if you live with a companion dog or a cat or a bird, you can learn so much from them and really come to appreciate who they are, how smart they are, how emotional they are. But, you know, the really important thing, I think, is for people to come to an understanding of the reciprocity in that relationship. We make them, if you will, feel good, and they make us feel good. So it's a, it's a two-way street. And I think that what's happening now is, you know, it's like a rubber band stretching. People get really alienated from nature. Um, animals who they once really loved and felt some sort of connection to become pests. And, you know, the minute that happens... Human interests always trump the interests of the animals. That's just, you know, who we are. When you, and I love the way in, in your work, The Animal Manifesto, and as well as a book I haven't had a chance to read in a while, The Emotional Lives of Animals and Wild Justice, you cite that there are really six things about this manifesto um, that an animal manifesto would consist of. Can we look at some of those together for a minute? Yeah, do you have them listed? I there? do. You and I'll I'll read them and you can comment to them one at a time. The first okay, is all animals share the earth and we must coexist. Right. I mean the, the the notion that we have to coexist and we share the earth, you know, is deeply rooted in biology in terms of webs of nature that we are part of the beautiful and the complex and the intricate webs of nature and each and every um, being, if you will, in that web is really important. So coexistence and sharing, you know, the limited resources of our planet really um, is mandated. I mean, it's, it's really clear that we're not doing very well when the scales are tipped in our favor. The second one is animals think and feel. Right. And once again, I like to say science is catching up with what many of us really know already, but you know, almost every day you read about new discoveries in animals that, you know, mice show empathy, fish feel pain. Just two weeks ago, there was a wonderful study showing that chickens feel empathy and feel the pain of other chickens. Now, you know, as a biologist, I don't find that all so surprising, but, you know, once again, um, we're learning so much about not, not only, you know, animal cognition and how intelligent and, and, and how adaptable animals are, but how deep their feelings run. They grieve, they feel joy, embarrassment, resentment, and envy, for example. Yeah, some of them have lifelong companionship and groups that travel together. And, and it, But before we come to the, to the others, I, I just wanted to ask you a, sort of a general question, uh -huh. because to you and I, and I think to a lot of the listening audience, the things we say are very apparent. And we've done a great deal of work over the last 20 plus years on this program and others about this whole area of our relationship with all life, of all kingdoms. Mm -hmm. When do you think as a humanity, though, this separation, this notion that animals don't feel pain, that animals don't communicate, that somehow or other whatever we do to them isn't relevant? You mean that we should just not? Um, well, it, it's, I think as a child, children, for instance, if they understand that what they're eating is an animal, most of them won't eat it. Yeah. Oh, when, when kids discover that a hamburger was a cow or that bacon was, you know, babe the pig, 
they are they they are really they're almost offended. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, I I have been I do a lot of kids work with Jane Goodall's Roots and Shoots groups, and it's just incredible. I mean, they're dumbfounded to learn that you know uh, uh, that chicken was one of these birds who was running around. And um, so when so the the I guess I'm sort of always asking myself these questions. So I like to ask people like yourself who dwell in this field with mm-hmm. other researchers and other people who are sort of asking these same questions. Is is it a question of the human heart being so cold even to its own nature that disallows our feeling the nature of other life form? Mm-hmm. Well, that's a big question. I wrote a book called Wild Justice with. Um, my colleague Jessica Pierce, and also in the Animal Manifesto. No, I mean, I think that there's just a lot more good in ourselves and other species, and that we've been duped in a way by misreadings of Charles Darwin's ideas about survival of the fittest, Mm -hmm. of nature red in tooth and claw. And, And what we're learning now is from really great scientific research in the field of you know wild animals who are able to do what they're supposed to be do to be a card carrying chimpanzee or gorilla or wolf or coyote for example we're learning that they're actually quite peaceful sure they fight and sure they compete but for most species more than 90% of their behavior is what we call prosocial positive bonding affiliative and a very small percentage of their behavior is actually aggressive and competitive, but it's the aggressive interactions that really catch our attention. Right, and it, and it almost looks like an outpicturing, almost like we project our personality. They might say we're anthropomorphizing, but if so, not in a healthy way because we're projecting our own tendencies of aggression and behavior on them. I mean, when you right. say that, that's what it makes me think. Right. When somebody tells me, you know, you, oh, you're behaving like an animal, I always say thank you. And I know that comes across as being, you know, a little cocky or right. something. But, but no, I mean, it really is the case. I've been teaching a course in a, in a jail for the last 11 years. And one of the bases is to use animal models for uh, cooperative and, you know, these positive pro-social behaviors. And, you know, when the guys just start acting up, you know, and somebody says, oh, you know, hey, you know, you're acting like an animal. I always say, well, you just complimented them. And I really mean it. And I think, but I think we're in the middle of a paradigm shift. There's been wonderful work done by a psychologist at the University of California named Daka Keltner, who a few years ago uh, wrote a book called Born to be Good. And um, I happened on that book while I was writing the manifesto, and then Daka and I have been in contact a lot because we really both agree that, you know, sure, you see and you hear about all the attention-getting, you know, divisive, warlike, evil behavior. But the fact of the matter is most humans are, I mean, the vast majority of humans are really good people. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. Yeah, I mean, and so so that's where I think, you know, in, in, you know, with respect to what we were talking about before, I think that, to save our planet and to save ourselves because, you know, I always say when animals lose, we lose, and we suffer the indignities that we expose other animals to, that when we really come to understand that real integral, the integral webs of nature and that each and every individual counts, I mean, I'm looking forward, I don't know if I'll be around, but certainly for You know, our children and their children, that's the only hope for a more peaceful future. Right, and and, and I think so many people's interest in traditions and faiths that promote compassion and promote reverence and really live it, just don't talk about it as a theology, but evidence it in their works and in their deeds. Um, I want to come back to these few other issues of points that would be part of the animal manifesto then we're going to have to take a short break um but so the first one was all animals share the earth and we must coexist animals think and feel animals have and deserve compassion right that's exactly what i was just talking Mm -hmm. about you know that you know that there's numerous examples across the animal kingdom of compassion and empathy 
feeding an animal who's ill um, in some horrific experiments. But, you know, we learned from them that, you know, um, rats and monkeys, for example, will not feed when they see another animal, you know, rat or a monkey, being shocked or suffering for their taking food. Um, you know, the, the mind-blower to me is that these studies were done 50 years yeah, ago. Yeah, yeah. And they're solid research, and somehow they got lost, you know, in the fray of people really trying to understand war and, you know, evil behavior. You know, because there, there was a time when we would, you know, look to animals to justify our own negative behaviors. Well, that's why it's, it's also interesting to me almost that we're sort of unwrapping our own reptilian brain and, yeah. you know, and, and outpicturing it and casting that onto the animal kingdom, which is already beyond that reptilian brain because it's what it's always been, which is a divine nature. <laughs> and it's, yeah. We're the ones sort of evolving in our own sort of self-reflective way. But the, the next one was, I just want to get to these last three. I'll read the three and then you can comment on all three as, as a group. Connection breeds caring. Alienation breeds disrespect. Our world is not compassionate to animals. And finally, acting compassionately helps all beings and our world. Right. So, you know, we've covered them, in, you know, in some ways. But you're right. I mean, when we're alienated from nature, we don't feel attached to nature. And it's that bonding or the attachment that really leads us to be more compassionate and empathic with animals. And, you know, the really big thing that's coming out of a lot of research is, once again, that reciprocity. You know, when, when you pet a dog, the dog's heart rate and blood pressure goes down, and so does yours. Um, you know, people just, I, I did some work last summer with some um, veterans from Iraq and Afghanistan who suffered PTSD and some other physical maladies. And um, I gave a talk to them and they had their dogs there. And I mean, it was, it was without a doubt, one of the most moving times of my life to listen to these men and women you know, basically just tell you how their dogs save their lives, mm -hmm. that when they start, you know, having really difficult times, the dogs read that and come over. And just petting the dog or the dog, you know, leaning into the person really relieves a lot of their stress. And so, once again, as soon as, you know, I always tell people, too, that even if you don't care about animals, which is hard to believe, but even if you don't, if you treat them well, then humans will benefit. Absolutely. I mean, what yeah. we put out in the world, whether it's to human and animal, plant, the vegetables, how, how we, what do we call it, emanate outwards is mm -hmm. what comes back inwards. So, um, Absolutely. Right. The give receive, you know, the old um, great Buddhism relationship between, you know, you receive what you give. Mm -hmm. and, and it really, it's really true. I just can't tell you, you know, I'm not a dog psychologist. I I'm not a dog trainer, but I've worked with canids a lot, you know, members of the dog family and, other, and many other animals, birds. And I always tell people that, you know, you have to be patient. You can't expect immediate rewards. You know, a lot of animals, they're, they're curious and they're cautious at the same time. But I always tell them that just wait and you'll just see that reciprocity and you receive what you give. You give grief, you get it back. You give joy, you get it back. Well, and it's interesting. We're having an animal communicator on late, later, and I've done that kind of work for most of my life, either intuitively or worked with those who actually do it professionally. And they always say that the animals just say, praise the things you want me to do. Yep. <laughs> and and it's it's a really um, old teaching as well in, in the Hasidic tradition of Judaism that you praise the quality in a child that you want to bring out because when we, or in a human, in an adult, when we praise that quality, we tend to make it bigger and the person makes it bigger. So, right. and, and that's why positive, you know, in dog training, positive reinforcement, not negative reinforcement mm -hmm. is really the way to go. And once again, if you take the time to watch wild animals, you'll see that they're positively reinforcing one another during play, by grooming one another, by, by sharing food. I mean, they, I'll tell you, negativity just doesn't work <laughs> in the long run. <laughs>
We'll we'll be right back with the man who just said it straight. Negativity doesn't work. Dr. Mark Beckoff is our guest. You can find many of his 20 books, the most recent, The Animal Manifesto, Six Reasons for Expanding Our Compassion Footprint, a New World Library 2010 release. And you can find a link to his website at ours right on the front page at www.21st21stcenturyradio.com. This is Kevin Schneider, Executive Director of the Non-Human Rights Project, the only civil rights organization in the United States working to establish fundamental rights for non-human animals. You can find out more about us at nonhumanrights.org. And you're listening to 21st Century Radio with Dr. Zohara Hieronymus. Welcome back to 21st Century Radio. I'm Dr. Zohara Hieronymus, and joining us is Dr. Mark Beckoff from that wonderful place called Boulder, Colorado. Once my old stomping grounds, Mark. Oh, wow. Yeah, those were great years, actually. He joins us. We're talking about, um, I guess one would say, the difference between animal rights and animal welfare. Maybe you can address that issue. Yeah, I mean, I like to think of myself and sort of the movement as being an animal protection movement. There's shades of gray, you know, and sometimes, you know, you have to really pay attention to the details. But basically, animal welfareists would be people who are concerned about the welfare and the well-being of animals, but also could find themselves supporting the use of animals when the benefits to humans outweigh the costs to the animals. I mean, that's basically what drives, just drives a huge percentage of people. So, you know, for example, in research, you might say, well, I know I'm causing pain, suffering, and death to mice or chimpanzees or dogs or cats, but the benefits to human health outweigh those costs. Now, one of the tricky things here, of course, is how do you really measure the benefits and the cost, but it's humans who are doing that calculus. Um, for your readers who know about u- utilitarianism, you know, it's just seeing whether the benefits outweigh the cost. So, so it gets pretty tricky Which pretty fast because it's really easy, you know, for a human to say that, oh, well, it's okay if, you know, a thousand chimpanzees die to save one human because one human is worth. I mean, essentially what you're saying is one human is worth more than a thousand chimpanzees. Animal rightists would be more in the abolitionist group. They would say, you know, they do not want invasive research done on animals. They don't want people eating animals or wearing animals or using them in any injurious way. So, so, the, animal, you know, so the animal rights position is, is a much more absolute um, abolitionist position. And... You know, I think most people find themselves, you know, um, be, you know, a lot of people. I shouldn't say most. I think I do think most people are really welfareists, um, but I think a lot of people I know find themselves, you know, sort of in that gray area between animal welfare and animal rights. I mean, there are some people who say, "Well, it's okay to do this, but not that." Right. It's okay to eat free grazing hens because they live a good life. But it's not okay to eat hens that have been raised in cages where they've never been able to fly and they break their beaks and all of these horrible things that happen. Exactly. No, exactly. And that could be, you know, a really good example. And, and I mean, you know, I always tell people, I mean, we live in a very complex world. I mean, we, and I don't mean that as a cop-out, but the demands on us as humans, you know, I like to say that we're big-brained, we're big-footed, and we're arrogant and we're invasive mammals. And I, don't, and I don't mean that in a negative way. That's just who we are. We've evolved into that incredibly dominating, overriding position. And with that comes enormous ethical responsibilities because we can basically do anything we want. To. Exactly. And, and, and I think know, that that's could... the bottom line, as you and so many, I think, ethicists point out, which is that we have to have an ethical imagination and heart that goes along with the sterility of analytic science. Exactly. Right. Because, because a lot of people say, well, you know, science is objective and, you know, it's value-free. No, of course it's not. I'll tell you, I mean, a good example, I was in Australia recently where they're just killing kangaroos left and right. So the academics 
down there who are saying, you know, we, we, we need to get rid of the culling, the killing of the kangaroos, their critics are saying, oh, you know, the role of science is to be objective. But their critics are academics who are supporting and some who are paid by the kangaroo farms. So, you know, it's like, well, wait a minute. If you're against something, then you're an advocate and you're not being objective. But if you're for something like the killing, then you're being objective. And I always say, as you know from reading my stuff, that first and foremost, scientists, researchers are people and we all come to the table with values. And so science is not an objective enterprise. No, and I, and I think physics has proven beyond a shadow of a doubt that, you know, call it what you want to call it, the observer effect or anything else, that anything we study, we change. And I think you make a wonderful case for that when we call it wildlife management, which turns out to be wildlife murder in many <laughs> instances. I mean, describe that for my audience. Well, I mean, basically, um, there's a branch of the government called Animal Damage Control, ADC, I like to call I like. Well, they're now called Wildlife Services. They were called Animal Damage Control, and I used to call them the Animal Death Corps. Mm -hmm. And now they're called Wildlife Services. They're a branch of the United States Department of Agriculture. And most people don't know this, and I'll bet you most of your readers don't know this, that millions of dollars go in to basically slaughtering animals. 90,000 coyotes last year, for example. You know, tons, millions of birds. And one of the things people don't know is the collateral damage that a lot of dogs and domesticated animals are killed as what they call, you know, unintentional, uh, non-target uh, species. But really, if and you just go online and go to the website for Wildlife Services, and if you've got the heart, you, you can look at their tables for um, basically slaughtering animals. Right? Well, you know, and, and the things you described are just straight out of military strategy that they've used for decades in cancer therapeutics, which is acceptable risk strategy, whether it's bombarding one person's body wholeheartedly or a whole area, as you point out, and whatever's there as collateral damage is almost looked at as just sort of anecdotal, that it's just not important enough. Exactly. Right. And... and um, you know, they've been called to question uh, what, what I always say about these government, you know, um, you know, mass slaughter programs is that they have the same, quote, problems every year. And if I were as bad as my at my job as they are at theirs, I would have been fired. I mean, it's, you know, history tells us that killing animals who we call, quote, pests simply does not work. And, you know, once again, I tell people that even if you don't care about the well-being of the animals, you just have to look sort of at the facts. And the fact is that these mass poisoning, trapping, snaring, shooting from airplane sorts of programs have never worked and they never will work because basically the people doing them ignore the biology of the species. They they. They just don't pay attention to what we know about who these animals are. And we'll come back to the 90,000 coyotes because from, from another perspective, I know somebody in the audience is saying, well, what are we supposed to do with all those wild animals that are right. coming into town and scaring the people or eating the livestock? What, what is the answer to that kind of question? Well, I mean, the fact is if you look at the data, it's just so rare. It's incredible. I mean... I, I, I just wrote an article on coyotes. You know, there have been just extremely few. If, you know, there was one a couple of years ago in Canada. It was a tragic, tragic killing of a, um, a very popular folk singer up there. It's the first known fatal attack by a group of coyotes on a person. Um, there, you know, there's loads of people get killed and maimed by dogs. Um, if you look at the data for wild, uh, predation on wildlife by animals such as coyotes and wolves, it pales in, in, uh, when compared to, say, the number of animals who are lost due to disease and poor husbandry. Um, and so I think what happens, once again, it's almost 
analogous to that nature red in tooth and claw. It's the sorts of things that attract attention. Uh, National Ge- Geographic Society just had um, a program called Killed by Coyotes, and it was about this unfortunate tragedy in Canada where uh, Taylor Mitchell, this young woman, was killed by coyotes. And, I mean, when you watch that show, they reconstruct the story and the conclusions that they draw are just not borne out by the observations. But what I'm saying is, you know, it it wouldn't make an hour-long documentary to say, wow, aren't these coyotes nice? Right. And, and of course, we see that that's the problem with the hysterics in media in general, that it's in the business of polarization and hysterics, not in the business of education and refinement. Exactly. And, but, you know, slightly things are changing, uh, yeah. i.e. your show and a lot of the interviews I do and a lot of the um, say magazines for which I write. Exactly. You know, just, you know, once again, I always say just put out there who these animals are, you know, and people will change their attitudes towards them. But it's just so easy to manipulate people, you know, in terms of the fear-mongering and the sensationalism. I mean, it is a tragedy when a wild animal harms or kills a human. I live in the mountains outside of Boulder, Colorado. I have black bears and cougars and foxes and coyotes at my house, and I've had three Close encounters of the lion kind, I call them. I mean, I've been within <laughs> touching distance of cougars, and I survived them. And, you know, if people say, wow, that's amazing, how cool. No, there was nothing cool about it. I don't need to have that happen again, but the fact of the matter is I've chosen to live where I do, so I can't just, you know, kill these animals when they bother me. Well, and and I think that that is the challenge. I mean, we were going to be joined later this evening by a woman who founded the um, Vets Association. It's an international organization that goes and does deployment. It's called the, why have I just lost this, the World Vets International Aid for Animals. Mm. And so they're in Japan right now. And I think to myself, here is this wonderful group of 2,700-some vets who volunteer all over the world and deploy, and then they ratchet up their um, ability to both raise funds and do the work and work with local charitable people. And I think we see this after Katrina, the amount of of people who were concerned about the animals. So certainly people's awareness is increasing. Oh, it is. And and really things are getting better. I mean, I'm I'm kind of a hardcore, natural-born optimist and um, dreamer, and people sometimes just go, how can you? Well, one of the advantages of doing what I do, you know, full-time every day is, sure, I read about all the horrors, but I meet amazing people either in person because I travel quite a bit or, you know, over email or phone. And so there's always hope. And I've worked with some kids groups in Colombia, in South America, Romania, Spain, China, India, and, you know, you just see slowly the tide is changing. And I think one of the things that's happening is as people feel less stressed in their own lives, it's easier for them to reach out to the animals who need them. And that's where, that, you know, that's where my hope really comes from. Well, and I also think as humanity awakens to its own inner, what I like to call reverent nature, mm-hmm. we then are reverent towards nature. So it's also this own inner awakening that's happening across the planet. And I've always said I thought it was the silver lining of global catastrophe, is that it actually heightens everybody's awareness rather than deadens it and brings people together rather than separates them. It's a hard way to learn through suffering, but it seems to be part and parcel of, of, of the human trajectory. Not that it needs to be, but it seems to be. Exactly. And, 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 and yeah, I always think when people feel better about themselves, then it's easier to give mm-hmm. the love and the reverence and the benevolence, you know, that is really required. And I think as time goes on and people realize that it actually feels good to be kind, there's actually been some interesting neurobiological studies that show that when people are nice to one another and they're kind and they cooperate, the reward centers of the brain light up. And, you know, if you, once again, if you ask people, you know, generally, how do you feel when you've done something really nice? I'll tell you, they feel really, they feel really good. 
and how do you feel when you've done something that you know you realize wasn't all that nice, and you realize that they feel really good um, badly. Yeah, we used to joke about that how selfish it was to do good because it just felt so good. <laughs> right, and, that's, and that you no, know, I agree. And people, you know, sometimes people will say, "Oh well, you know, all you people just do." good, but it's selfish because it feels good. No, that's just not even close. I always think it's funny, though. It's kind of like the feedback loop is so positive, but you do it because it's our nature. I mean, I think all of the traditional paths of the wisdom keeping, I don't care what tradition, all speak to the same thing about humanity and why we're here, and we're here to serve. So when humans serve, they fulfill their greatest good and purpose. And uh, to me, that's the simple story. But look, we're going to take a little break, come back, and maybe talk about the $17 billion industry of how we love our cats, our dogs, our ferrets, our birds, all those things domestic we've taken into our lives. We'll be right back on 21st Century Radio with Dr. Mark Beckoff. Get his latest book, The Animal Manifesto, Six Reasons for Expanding Our Compassion Footprint, a New World Library 2010 release. Go to www. 21st 21stcenturyradio.com Hello, this is Tamarack Song and I'm the author of Entering the Mind of the Tracker Native Practices for Developing Intuitive Consciousness and Discovering Hidden Nature You can learn more about me and my work at www.tamaracksong.org You are listening to 21st Century Radio with Dr. Zohara Hieronymus Welcome back to 21st Century Radio. I'm Dr. Zohara Hieronymus, and online with us is Dr. Mark Beckoff, B-E-K-O-F-F, if you want to Google him, M-A-R-C. He's Professor Emeritus of Ecology and Evolutionary Biology at the University of Colorado Boulder. He is also Scholar-in-Residence at the University of Denver's Institute for Human-Animal Connection, and I've read two of his 20 books, the most recent, The Animal Manifesto, Six Reasons for Expanding Our Compassion Footprint, A New World Law. Library 2010 release. Mark, it's very easy for most humans who have had an experience with a dog like you did when you were younger with Moses or me and my six dogs or the 30 or so in my lifetime. Many people in our audience have pets, have had cherished pets who have passed on. It's a $17 billion business. It's big business. And yet it doesn't seem to get in the way of people's compassion. Yeah, I mean, one of the questions I always ask people who make their living or don't seem to spend a lot of time thinking about horrible things we do to animals is, would you do it to your dog right. or cat? And they, it, it actually stills them. And they'll say, well, what do you mean? And, you know, I'll say, well, would you put your dog on a factory farm? You know, would you let somebody do to your dog what they do to dogs in biomedical labs. And I don't do it to be, you know, really confrontational. I do it to, you know, sort of raise awareness, raise consciousness, and get them to think about it. But to provoke the right. feelings. The feelings, right. And what surprises me is how easy it is for people, some people, not all people, obviously, but for some people to not make that connection. So I'll say, well, you know, you're buddy dog is no more sentient than a dog, you know, in a breeding puppy mill or a dog in a laboratory or, you know, for that matter, a cow or a pig. And and it's important to remind our audience, we're not talking about a couple hundred thousand. We're talking about billions of animals. Yeah. This is wholesale torture. This is, this is not an occasional experiment and an occasional poor creature gets hurt. This is, this is systematic torture. Yeah, exactly. And the other thing, I mean, it's funny that you just said that because that was the other thing I was going to say. Then I will, you know, I'll say, well, you know, would you do it to your dog? But the other question I always ask them is, do they have any concept of the numbers? And when they, I tell them, literally, I mean, this is just not even, you know, arguable. Billions of animals are used in research. You know, mice and rodents other rodents are not protected by the Animal Welfare Act, for example, in the United States. You know, billions of animals, you know, are served up as food, and they're sentient beings just like your dog and your cat. And the other thing I always say, um, which actually came to me mid-talk once, um, 
I'll just I say to people, you know, it's not what you're eating and wearing, it's who you're eating and wearing. And I gave a talk in New Zealand last year, and two women came up after my talk and said they would never eat animals again. I mean, I was very happy about that, but I said, oh, well, you know, why? And they said, because the minute you said who's for dinner, it really changed their whole mindset. You know, it was, it's again, raising consciousness that they're eating pain, they're eating suffering and death, but they're eating a sentient being who suffered for an unneeded meal. Right, and, and, and I think that's where I think the breakdown comes is people make a disconnect between, well, what's my need and what's my desire? What's the planetary need and what's the planetary desire? And and there have been times in humanity's life cycle where hunting and killing you depended on it for your survival. And sure. certainly we've done shows over the years about the cost to the economy and agriculture and the watershed and, and the grain supply and the carbon footprint because of the amount of land we use to raise animals, to slaughter them, to eat, which we don't need and which we know has led to so much ill health. Exactly. I mean, I, you know, just, you know, putting it out there, you know, once again, you know, it's not a, it's not a contestable matter about, you know, the amount of cruelty that's added to the world when animals are used and abused in certain ways. It's not a matter of speculation, you know, about the environmental and atmospheric effects of factory farms. You know, so so it's just, you know, I like to say, like I say in the manifesto, you just have to to put it out there, my, one of my favorite expressions is leap and the net will appear. And, <laughs> and I apply that to sort of the science I do and the research others do is put it out there. And once again, you know, like um, Yes Magazine recently just had a whole issue about animals. You know, you just wouldn't have seen this mm -hmm. a couple of years ago. You know, you just, you know, an entire issue. And I just did a huge interview for... It's, it's actually a magazine called Dogs, but it's one of the biggest ones in Europe. You know, it's just the, the tide is changing, and it's be, you know it's because of radio shows like yours, and it's because of mass media, who says, okay, look, you know, who who are these animal beings with whom we share the planet? Well, and as I like to remind everybody, is everybody's crying for the same thing, which is um, is unity, and that's the job on the planet is to bring unity between all of us and all the species and all life. And Mark, I want to thank you for just the wonderful job you've done of of leading this calling charge of the heart for the animal kingdom and being a voice for so many sentient creatures that otherwise might not have had one. Well, thank you for your kind words, and I hope that your listeners come away with something that will make them add compassion to the world. Amen to that. Don't go away, folks. We'll be back for more on 21st Century Radio. If you have questions about your own animals, our local animal pet speaker, Terry Diener, joins us, and I'll tell you a little bit about the international group of vets that go around the world to help those in need. Mm -hmm.